You're going to get tired of seeing me up here, so I'm going to let Lynn do some talking. <laughs> uh, we were able to meet with Kenda and David Kapaku again last night. We actually got to do it through a Zoom meeting. They had to drive, oh, about, what was it, 40 miles? No, seven miles to the oh, church. Oh, seven miles, sorry. Seven miles to the church because they were having rain. And when they have rain, the satellite doesn't work. So then they don't even have stuff at the house. So it's amazing what they do and where they live. But it's pretty cool. So we're going to show you some pictures. They're a little difficult to see. They're so much better on my phone. But this is their sanctuary. If you could see this in true color, it is a bright red carpet with bright red chairs. Uh, I believe the cross is even red. The, all the other stuff up there that's dark colored is red. I'm pretty sure. I was really amazed. I was like, wow, this is really colorful and beautiful. Um, it was built in 1964. And if you look over to the left where you see cars and you see some house, housing roofs and then obviously the ocean, um, he was able to tell us. He got us a, a close-up um, guide in last night. And they're surrounded by millionaires. Uh, Lucas, uh, ex-wife, George, George Lucas's ex-wife lives right behind them. So I asked him, I said, well, how many are you missioning to? Like, who comes to your church? Well, they actually do have one that comes to their church. So he didn't say who, but it was pretty cool. Of course, these pictures just do not do Hawaii any justice. This is their Bible study that we're praying for that we talked about last week that Catherine is leading. They have about five to six that attend. It's on Tuesdays um, from 10 to 12 at that they're meeting. Um, this is that leadership center we talked about last week that they put into a parsonage and uh, they're hoping to build leaders um, from this, uh, being able to uh, host other uh, community agencies and that sort of thing. That's the outside of the church. As you see, the door of faith and it is red. They're very big on the red color there. Um, Sunday worship is at 9. He said he would have joined us today, but it had been 3 a.m. So he said, no, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to let Lynn talk about this one. <laughs> this is how they get their water. They get it off of the roof. It goes into this big tub right here, and then it goes down into the house. This is what they use for their bathroom. And dishwasher. And, and dishwasher and things like baths. that. Baths. Not bathrooms. Baths and dishwashing. Yeah. And then we have a better picture later. These, she loves gardening and jigsaw puzzles, so you'll see many beautiful gardening and that's coconuts, um, just different things. That is their home. Um, that was built by their uh, grandfathers, I believe is what he was saying. And there's a better picture come up. Oh, there's the holding tank for the water that they need to use for their dishwashing and that sort of thing. This one I didn't understand. <laughs> and this is their, their solar power. This is the batteries that operate that solar power that hold the energy for it. He said those batteries only last a year because the refrigerator is going 24 seven. So he has to change those batteries once a year. Otherwise, she said they were using, before this, they were using um, propane, but they were also using ice. And she said it took a lot of ice to try to do. She said, I had to go six weeks without a refrigerator. And I told him, I cannot live like this. We need to have a refrigerator. So uh, this is their house. As you see, they have the creek that we were talking about that goes right by their house. And actually, I think one of the pictures, there, it goes right under the porch to the right, to the left there. And uh, that's what he goes and gets water every day from, so they are able to use their toilet. And then I asked him if this was the outhouse, and he's like, no, that's my tool shed. I'm like, oh, sorry. I'm like, I was so embarrassed, but anyway, he's like, no, it's good, it's good, it's good. Um, so just keep them in mind. Um, they go to Ohana, which is 40 miles away, for just their post office box. Not just, but to think, you have to go get your mail, they only go maybe, she said, twice a month, or if they know something's coming in, they'll go a little more frequently, because that 40 miles takes them about an hour and a half. He said it's half as long getting out to a blacktop road as it is going on the blacktop road to where they need to be, um, but they do their laundry in there. They get their propane gas for their stove. Um, they use little bottles, she said, that we would use on our grills for their gas stove. They don't have anybody that will bring pro propane out in a, like a big tank or anything like that. Um, let's see, we run over that. Just, again, they're talking again about they're just in real struggle in Hawaii. Um, they're still not open, nothing, nothing's open. No, there's no restaurants open, there's no hotels open. Um, 
He says every time you go down the street, we were in Lahana just the other day, he said, and just everything, that we, things that we thought were open and, and working okay, they're closed up, they're boarded up, they're just moving out. They're going to the mainland in California or wherever to take their business because they just don't have any. Now he said we did see a news report that there is some tourism coming back in, um, even though they have these restrictions of air fare, air flighting, uh, ah, air, whatever, travel, travel. Air thank you. <laughs> And the COVID tests and all this kind of stuff. Um, we asked about their schools, and they're not open. They're all virtual. And he said, we need a lot of prayer for that, too, because we don't govern our own schools on Maui. Oahu holds the school board, and they govern all schools in all islands of Hawaii. So they govern 200 to 300 schools. And if you can imagine, I mean, Cumberland Valley, they choose what they want to do. Mechanicsburg chooses what they want to do. I mean, we have all these different... You know, districts that get to choose what they want to do, virtual, in person, whatever. He said, no, there's like 12 people that make the decision for all their schools. And he said they're struggling. Now, the private schools are in person, but the children are really struggling with um, failing and grades and that sort of thing. So just really pray for, for that whole issue. All right, and then they have some prayer requests for this week. It's a Catherine for week two of the Bible study. Uh, they had five people on Tuesdays. Uh, and it goes from 10 to 12, and it's on a study of Ephesians. The six-week study, uh, once that ends, is going to be about spiritual warfare. And he said, anytime you know, if you say something about spiritual warfare, what happens? The devil comes in there 20 times worse. But he said, to help him to pray for that so he can, um, he can do that, and they're going to learn about intercessory prayer, how to continue to do that to get to do the different things. And then he also said, uh, there's a little girl named Ada Rose. She's three years old. She's in the hospital. Uh, it's a congregate, uh, granddaughter. a granddaughter who's in the hospital. So keep her in prayer. We don't really know what's wrong with her, but she's in the hospital. And they're, they're kind of concerned about that. Um, before we pray about that, and that's, that's one thing that I, uh, I noticed when we were talking to them. They're very appreciative that we... Zoom meeting them and looked them in the face. He, he said it's the first time that a church has reached out that far to them. Ever to be missionaries in churches of God. Nobody other than Ben Tobias who needs to because he's guiding them as missionaries. Nobody has reached out to them by a phone call or a FaceTime. So we're treading on new waters here, guys. And anybody who wants to give us any kind of guidance or help on this, please feel free to do so. And if you want to, you know, contact them, they'd be glad to talk to anybody. They're just eager to talk to people. And they are so, they couldn't get, they couldn't tell us enough. And they just said, we're supposed to tell you aloha. And there was another word and I don't remember how to say it. <laughs> and um, he said, it just means God with you and thank you because we just are so blessed by having your church reach out to us. Um, please remember, I want to send a care package um, we're going to send this prayer shawl to them and maybe throw some goodies in that we can think of that might last the, the trip out there. And um, they were so appreciative of that, too. They said, you're really going to send that to us? I said, yeah, we're going to send that to you. So they're so excited about getting this gift package, too. So um, just keep them in prayer. Dear Lord, we just bring these missionaries up to you. They have chosen to make their lives for you. They've left all their family and, uh, and their different things, and they chose to lead people for you. Help them to always know that we are praying for them. Help them to always know that they can lead on us when they, they get lonely and they, uh, they just don't know what to do. Just help them to be able to reach out to us also and help us to continue to reach out to the missionaries, to continue to... Let them know that we pray for them, that we, have, we want them to have strength because that the missions that they do is, is just fabulous to me. It's just they give up everything they have for you. And that's what we should all do. We should all just put you first in our lives. No matter what's happening in our lives, you need to be number one, Lord. And we just take this shawl when we send it, help them to feel the prayers that have went over this shawl and helped them to feel the love that this church has for missionaries and has for them and help us to continue 
to be mission focused, Lord. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Anyway, uh, as we've been doing this series, the church today is that last one of the. La this is the last uh, series. If you've been taking notes and you've been seeing, but um, talking about the church and you are the salt of the earth, and so we're going to go to Matthew chapter five. Uh, verses 1 to 13, and it's very familiar. The first part of it is you probably are like, well, we're going to do the Beatitudes, uh, but we're going to be honing in on verse 13. So as you get to Matthew 5, here, online, on your phone, whatever device you are using, um, I would ask if you would stand with me as we read God's Word. And you at home, if you would do the same thing, Joining together, standing out for the respect of God and his word. Matthew chapter 5. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Heavenly Father, again, we are so grateful for your word. We ask, Lord, that your word speak to us now. Open our ears. Soften our hearts to your Holy Spirit that had these words penned for us today. May we receive them as you wish in our hearts today, right where we're at. You know what we've been through. You know where we're headed. You know where we're at in our walk with you today. I thank you in advance for what you will speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, the, the Sermon on the Mount, it wasn't given to provide guidelines to an unbelieving world. Actually, it was given to provide direction and a description of the character of the ideal kingdom citizen. When Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, he was, speci he was speaking specifically to his disciples. Those who were, uh, were characterized by the true virtues set forth in the verses of the Beatitudes. See, the Beatitudes are not just a pious word spoken. They constitute a vivid description of the characteristics of ideal citizens of the kingdom of God. Characteristics of the ideal citizens of the kingdom of God. That's us. We are the kingdom. This is the kingdom of God here on earth. Not one of them ideal things of, okay, when I get to heaven, that's going to be my characteristics. No, it's, it's here. And we see that those who possess these spiritual characteristics will provoke a response from others around them. People who are 
ill disposed toward God and his ways who are against, basically that's a fancy way, polite way to say those who are against or don't look favorably toward God and his ways of life, they will respond with persecution toward the sincere follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe you have seen that. Maybe you have run into that. That when you share or talk about or live the life of Jesus, so you live a life of a Christian that sometimes people will, he says, will persecute you. See, ideal kingdom citizens will have, we need to have a hopefully a wholesome effect on those around us that are well disposed, who are in favor of, who walk toward God as we serve as salt of the earth in light of the world. In verses 10 to 16, our Lord describes the negative and the positive responses of the unbelieving world toward his disciples. And we see that, and we know that Jesus, he's, he's this master communicator. He used common experiences and objects to communicate these great truths about God, about people, about various roles and responsibilities. And the interesting thing of salt in that day, it was very common, very significant. And this metaphor that Jesus uses to describe the nature and function of his church. People now, you think where he's at is by the Sea of Galilee. People by the sea and salt water, it was easy for them, it was easy for them to get salt. Now the people inland, they had it was a little harder for them. They had to barter for it. They, they just they had to barter, they had to trade in things to get to get salt to keep things preserved. And it's interesting that uh, a Roman soldier, part of his pay was given it to him in salt. Um, and, and the word that used there, it was called uh, salarium, S-L-A-S-A-L-A-R-I-U-M, salarium. Well, it's a Latin word that we get our word salary. So anyway, hence we could understand why salt was considered so valuable. And so Jesus expected his church to function as the salt of the earth. So our question this morning, are we salty? Or have we lost our saltiness? And those things that come to my mind, you know, is he worth his salt, right? You ever heard of that, you know, or an old salt? <laughs> but an old salt, though, sometimes old salt isn't very good. And we're going to look at some of them things here this morning that but salt is very important. And as salt, the church is very valuable. The church is valuable to the heart of God and to, live, and to the living Christ for the carrying out, the carrying forward of the work that Jesus began on his earthly ministry. As a salt, the church is also valuable to community and to the world. Few people would want to live in a community where the influence of the church was not felt. I don't know about you, but that's, that's a fact. See, it's kind of difficult for us here in the Western world to fully evaluate the value of the people of God. Sometimes we take it for granted. But to think about the value the people of God have brought into our culture, into our government, and into our entire way of life. We take it for granted. How important, how valuable the people of God who've come before us have put down the foundations The importance needed in our culture, our government, in our entire way of life. Think about some of those things in our culture. That if they were not there, look at other cultures. Other issues they have in their daily living. 
that sometimes we take for granted or we as the church struggle in living out. We shouldn't be struggling in the living out. We should be standing on as salt, as preser preserving, and we're going to look at that. But to think about the value, how valuable the church is. And remember, who is the church? We are. Anyone who proclaims Jesus Christ as Savior is the church. And our ways in the Word of God and standing for those truths is valuable. As salt, the church is essential to the world's well-being. I have you ever thought about that, but our Lord used this metaphor to describe the church's simple, essential functions in the community. And what are some of the functions? What are some of the functions of salt back in that day? I'm glad you asked. I have a few here. Salt was used as a condiment. And we use it today for some of these very same things. It adds zest to food, right? When food, especially vegetables, actually all food though, but when it tastes flat, it needs some seasoning, what do you do? As we're thinking about this, I'll put some nice thoughts in your head of tomatoes and cantaloupe and watermelon and all those things. How many of you put your salt on it? Oh, I heard it. Yeah, see? But it needs, you put salt on it and it livens up the flavor. And so, that's the remedy. And so also needed is, it, we need salt in our bodies, right? You can't live, you, you, there's a balance that we have to have. And I'm noticing the older you get, sometimes you have to monitor that. Amen. But anyway, but you get the salt. The salt doesn't work like it used to. The body doesn't function. Yeah, so, but, but salt is important. So the ideal Christian in the ideal congregation is to bring this beauty, this fragrant, but also a flavor to the life of the community that is wholesome and helpful. That's what salt is to do. We are to be. And when I use the word community today, I believe it's community, us as a community, as much as community outside our walls. That it works both ways. That we are to be helpful, wholesome, under the community of believers and reach out to also our lifestyle as salt of the earth is going to be looked at and affecting the community around us. Salt was used also as an antiseptic. It was uh, a cleaning agent that served the same functions as like we use peroxide and alcohol today. And maybe some of you use salt today for some of that stuff. I don't know, but... So when the church is functioning as it should, it will perform a cleansing and antiseptic function in the community. And that's... Looking at my life, I'm cleaned up a little better than what I used to be. And that is because of, that's my wife, Dana, she's a little biased, but that's pretty nice, that's pretty good. But the idea is to understand that the salt of the earth has purified, helped purify me, not just the word of God, but the community of believers. And still today, the congregation is able to and will continue to help clean me up as we clean one another up with the word of God. Being the salt of the earth. And that transforms then into changed people, into changed lives, into changed communities. And it's not us, it's the salt of being the salt of the earth. It is the characteristics of kingdom people. The main reason for salt is, the main reason back then, the primary one was, uh, these other ones were, were, other one, uh, were also used, but was the preservation of meat and fish from decay. And we think of 
our missionaries, the Capacus, and them saying about well, not having a refrigerator, having to use ice, and you know, back then there was no refrigeration. It was that was the salt that was to do that. And so here's Jesus and his disciples. They're close. He's ministering up and down the Sea of Galilee, and, and you know, there's many. There's several stories uh, or happenings that are recorded about the catching of fish, and and on a daily basis they're catching fish. And what happens if you don't? sell all your fish. You got to keep them and just can't throw them in, you know, just plug in the old mini cooler there. You know, they didn't have none of that. So what they do, they use, they use the, the salt to pack them. They had to pack it or, or go ahead and, and put it in a, in a brine, I guess, a salty brine liquid that they would keep them in uh, so it would keep them and preserve them. So what about us as a church then? The church. We are the church. And the church is a salt of the earth is to preserve the moral, spiritual, and cultural life of our community. That we are to stand up for, uh, stand up, but we're to preserve. It's not to the moral and spiritual direction of this community of the body of believers through the word of God is not to decay and decline which our world is trying very hard to hit trying to take the morals spiritual ethics cultural issues of the word of God and trying to tell the church that they're not important that's not true. Because it's important in the word of God. And so as the salt of the earth, we are to be able to proclaim that and help others understand moral, spiritual, cultural life. Again, go back to history. Go back to those before us who helped set up some standards that we are to live by. And we can see through history that life has been a struggle, but life has been good. They're the moral, moral, ethical standards of the word of God as salt of the earth, light then we live, we see it, helps us see that where we've come from and should caution us where we don't want to go. But the whole thing is the community, are we living as salt of the earth? Are we doing these things to others in, our, in ourselves, in our community? Because salt is silent but positive for. It's a silent but positive for. Salt does not make, it doesn't make a great outward display and it does not blow a trumpet concerning its presence. Salt just simply and silently performs its function. It's decisive and positive. And that's what Jesus would have our church to do. The church to be just as positive. Because we got a warning here as we close. We got a warning concerning possible calamity. Because Jesus, he, it must have been an issue because Jesus, he spoke it. And seeing that the possibility of losing its saltiness. And it's of no value, he says. They just throw it on the roadside where it won't hurt the crops, but they throw it on the roadside and it just gets traveled over. And Jesus is using this illustration to warn us as disciples of Jesus Christ that we are to be cautious that we don't lose our Christian witness and influence. Because salt could lose its saltiness if it's isolated. If you take the crystal line of, of salt and you separate them, if you put one over here on this piece of fish and it's like, a, it's not going to work very well, does it? No. No, it's not. And so the truth is of us as believers, if we separate ourselves from fellowship, from the fellowship of believers, either you walk away out of disobedience God forgive you and come on back or you just indifference or 
whatever it might be, and you're, there's non-involvement with anybody, then you need to ask God for forgiveness and you need to get back involved in the body. Simple as that, because you're going to lose your saltiness and really take an honest picture today of being home, not fellowshipping with anybody, stepping out, whatever the reason might be, are you as spiritually strong today as you were when you left? If you can say yes, more power to you, then that's good, but I, I doubt it. Uh, unless there's some other circumstances. But if you are isolated and away from, you will lose your saltiness. You will use, you lose your Christian witness, and there's a whole lot that goes on with that. So, thinking about that, also you can lose your saltiness whenever it gets contaminated, contact with other substances. If the salt gets mixed with dirt, sawdust, and other substances mixed with the salt, it loses its saltiness and is unable to perform its unique functions. So we as believers, we are put on guard and we have to think about our attitudes and our functions and our, and our what of our ambitions that go into and enter into our heart that would cont contaminate our lives. Again, destroying our influence and preventing us from being a distinctive follower of Jesus Christ. One of those things in our lives that shadow us and we're not salty because we have too much contamination of other things in our lives that people don't even know we're Christians sometimes. Well, I didn't know you were Christian. I didn't know you'd go to church. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe we just throw with little things, and that's okay that, to, to think about, okay, how am I being salt, Lord. What's being contaminated in my life that keeps my witness away? Because this is detrimental to the church. Because if we are to retain our true saltiness and perform the true ministries, our true ministries... That's not just we're looking at the, well, the ministries are still going on at the church. No, you are the church. You have ministries. You've got things to do for God. We have to stay close to the attitudes expressed in these beatitudes and let Jesus be Lord of our lives. We must make a positive response to that cleansing fire of the Holy Spirit. So that he can purge out our attitudes and our actions that would, contamin would contaminate our lives and ruin our witness. And some of those witnesses are nonverbal witnesses. Witnesses that you, things that, that happen that you can't, you can't vouch for. Because you don't get a chance to. They see something happen and they know it. And so that's one of them things that we can talk about that later. But think about this. Putting, if you put, if you put salt on your tongue, I didn't try this. They say though, but that will enhance your thirst. It, it just enhances your thirst for, for water. So think about being, Lord, you're calling us to be the church, the salt of the earth. Can we as followers of Jesus Christ, will we cause our lives to function as the salt that creates the thirst for the living Lord in our lives? That we have the living water in us, that we want to thirst for him, and throughout, because of that salt, it performs a many functions But the salt cannot generate new life. So you can do a lot of work, but it all comes back to the first thing, and that's Jesus Christ. He is the one to generate new life. You have to know Jesus as your Savior and Lord. You ask Jesus into your life to be Savior. You're saved. 
Now you have the Holy Spirit and you are the salt of the earth and you start living as a salty Christian. But hopefully as our lives go, are we, is that salt for the Lord? Is, is our thirst for the living water, as we have that, are we then moving out that having others those who are the salt of the earth, are we creating a thirst in the hearts of unbelievers to know our Savior? Are we as the church, as the salt of the earth, creating a thirst in the hearts of unbelievers to know the Savior? You have to understand, apart from the church, I don't read in Scripture about a plan B for people to come to know Jesus. For other than what you and I have come to know Jesus through somebody else, through the church, that we are challenged to be the church. That God wants to use you and me to be the salt of the earth that people may want to know about who Jesus is. And it starts from us inside, working outside, in our lives, in our witness, to be the salt of the earth. To understand how invaluable the church is and how essential it is to the world's well-being. So today, may God enhance our saltiness. May he be something in us today, and I don't know what it is for you and how the Spirit is speaking to you this morning, but to understand what you're a part of, how important you are to God, and, and, and the reason you are here, the reason online, and, and the thought process of right now today that as he speaks to us of being the salt of the earth, and the light of the world, light him shining through us. But to understand, do we have that saltiness? Do we have that, that thirst for him that others see our lives as they want to thirst for what we have? And that's the love of Jesus. And that's the forgiveness. That's, the direct, that's our life. May we just ask God to direct us today. And this morning, as we're getting ready to sing our closing hymn, I want to challenge you, do you know Jesus? Have you asked Jesus into your life? Because that's where it all starts. If we don't ask Jesus into our lives, if we don't have Jesus as our, as our Savior, he can't become Lord. So he's got to be Savior first. And he says, call upon that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you call upon him. And calling upon him is one of those, is just from your heart. And I want you to think about that because we're going to pray. I want you to pray. Don't, don't tune off right now. Just at the end, if, if you're thinking about, just stay online. And, and we're going to sing our closing song. And as God leads you and you just allow the Spirit, we're going to pray a prayer at the end of the service. And uh, ask Jesus into our life. So, Well, we just sang it. Talk about being salt. That God wants to send us out armored with all Christ-like grace in the fight to set men free. Grant us wisdom. Grant us the courage that we will fail not man in thee. That we don't fail our friends, our family, and people to know about Jesus and if we will be the salt of the earth. I know I fall short. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes and I don't. Sometimes I... I this opportunity sometimes. I mean, I don't want to be here preaching something to you that I'm not always, every time I see somebody, hey, you need to get saved. I, I, I miss opportunities too, but things like this today remind me that I need to be more sensitive. The Spirit of God to be more open, to be mindful of my witness. And am I, are we draw, am I drawing people to Him in my life? And I'm getting back. I didn't forget about you about praying about Jesus. And so that's what we're going to do. That's what we need. 
And so I want to pray with you that if you don't know Jesus and that you want to accept him as your Savior right now, we just bow our heads. Yes. And you feel that Holy Spirit saying, yeah, pray with him. And all, it's just a prayer. God, I need Jesus. I believe right now. I need Jesus. And I want to accept Jesus. I want to accept him as my Savior. Help me to believe that he died for my sins. Help me to believe and understand that he arose again, that he's a living Savior. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Change my heart today. Help me to follow you for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you need to tell somebody. Online, you have our email address. So you can pick up the phone and call. Well, don't call the office because you just get an answering machine. But, but if you're going to call today, send out an email. They say, hey, I prayed that prayer. What's next? Or help me with my walk with the Lord. Um, and we'd be loved, loved just to get a hold of you. And any of you here, the same thing goes for you right here live today. Um, but as we go now today, Father, thank you for challenging us. That you want us to be the soul of the earth. And it's only through you. Lord, may our thirst for the living water be advanced today. So that we may point people to you and their lives changed. Yes. As you've changed ours. For eternity. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.